Hello everyone, my name is Maciej Kurzyński. I am a postdoctoral fellow in the Advanced Institute for Global Chinese Studies at Lingnan University, Hong Kong. And I'll be presenting on the sublime from the perspective of modern Chinese literature. But first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for making this event possible and for allowing me to participate today in the conference. Uh, unfortunately, I can't make it in person due to teaching responsibilities, but I'm all the more grateful for this opportunity to take part in the event online. So once again, thank you very much. Um, part of this presentation will be drawing upon a published work. So this article is already out in the Journal of Digital Humanities or Shuzi Renwen. Uh, but I'm also going to add some new content and hopefully at some point this will grow into a chapter uh, in a book publication. So I look forward to your comments, uh, questions and criticisms. Uh, the sublime has proven a very important interpretive category in the studies of modern Chinese literature and culture, despite it being a Western aesthetic concept. So scholars have shown how Chinese art in the 20th century uh, China responded to historical challenges requiring new ways of rep representation, how the idea that man must conquer nature motivated the collective endeavor to redesign, to reshape the physical world, and how the Chinese artists tapped into the potential of grand scale imagery to represent the nation state. However, the ubiquity of this term in cultural critique is also a source of great difficulties uh, because the abundance of applications of this term, this concept makes it almost impossible to theoretically grasp what the sublime really means, what, is it, what it is about. And moreover, the debates as to whether the theory of the sublime is even possible continues to this day, as far as I know. And it is not at all a trivial question given that the sublime, at least traditionally, has pointed to the beyond. And if that's the case, then the question arises if it is even possible to delimit the meaning of the sublime through some kind of theoretical conceptualization. In this project, I offer a positive answer to this question. So I argue that the sublime is first and foremost a rhetorical or technical stylistic device that speaks to our bodies. In other words, I attempt to disentangle the sublime from ethical considerations inherent in one or another culture tradition. So for example, ancient Greeks idea of noble mindedness, Christian morality, enlightenment, freedom, or the idea of the Republic, etc. So I'm, I'm and to do that, I'm incorporating the findings from cognitive narratology and also using the tools of digital humanities to think about the sublime as an aesthetic experience triggered by specific narrative patterns, which can be detected, modeled, and thought about with the help of computational tools. But before I get into the computational aspect of this project, I want to start with the human body and the notion of sensory motor schema. So the body, as I understand it here, is schematic, and it is so due to the repetitive and predictable nature of the world. As Mark Johnson puts it, meaning grows from our visceral connections to life and the bodily conditions of life. We are born into the world as creatures of the flesh, and it is through our bodily perceptions, movements, emotions, and feelings that meaning becomes possible and takes the form it does. The recognition of bodily involvement in cognition and aesthetic experience is inherent to the notion of sensory motor schema, also called image schema or primary schema in psychology, which is a spatial and force dynamic pattern developed in early childhood that underlies more complex conceptual structures, such as metaphors or abstractions. So schemas are represented and approximated linguistically through words and phrases, but they have their actual neural correlates, correlates in the form of dynamic activation patterns uh, connecting various parts of the brain. In particular, scholars have focused on the sensory motor cortex. And schemas are evolutionarily important because uh, of their role in memory and learning. The reuse allows us to limit the necessary restructuring of neural connections and respond faster to novel stimuli, including language comprehension. So for example, emotions are often said to reside in one's heart, inside the heart, which involves the spatial schema container and the conceptual metaphor that maps upon this schema. Heart is a container. 
And likewise, to say that a melody is moving somewhere or rising is to use the schema motion and the metaphor musical succession is physical motion. Now, I believe that a literary analysis informed by the notion of sensory motor schema does not need to limit itself to the most basic spatial elements, but can also entertain the possibility of compound shapes, compound gestalts, whereby a number of patterns blend together to form more complex phenomenological contours. And indeed, I argue that the sublime experience involves a dynamic combination of multiple spatial primitives into a compound schema, which I will call sequential ascent beyond a boundary. So I'm using this somewhat lengthy term instead of transcendence, uh, since transcendence has not only lost its embodied significance to most readers, but it has also acquired overdetermined ethical and religious connotations. So by unfolding the literal meaning of the term from the Latin prefix trans meaning beyond and standard meaning to climb, I hope to draw attention back to the embodied aspect of this so-called strong experience. So now I'll try to disassemble this compound schema, compound pattern of sequential ascent beyond the boundary into its constituent blocks. Um, and there are three of them, I believe. So philosophers frequently employed spatial metaphors of elevation or rise, as well as boundaries or barriers to make sense of the experience that they called sublime. Uh, that is to say, they thought of the sublime in spatial terms. And an equally prominent feature in their discussions is the sequential nature of such experience. So for Immanuel Kant, the sublime takes place whenever the effort of comprehension exceeds the capacity of the imagination to comprehend the progressive apprehension in one whole of intuition. Berg argued that, quote, succession and uniformity of parts are what constitute the artificial infinite. Uh, Mendelssohn also defined the sublime as an experience in which a single impression is repeated without alteration uh, uniformly and frequently. In fact, in, if we go back all the way to Longinus and his treatise, his foundational work on the sublime, Perihipsus, uh, he already pointed to dense composition as a rhetorical effect, whereby one great phrase after another is wheeled into place with increasing force. Um, so I would like to point out that all these definitions, to greater or lesser extent, invoke all these three components that I just mentioned, right? Rising motion, like progressive apprehension in Kant, boundary, like in Mendelssohn, and sequentiality, like in Longinus, where he says that one phrase after another must be wheeled into place to produce this powerful visceral experience. And because all of them invoke these three components, I believe they hint at the crucial characteristics of the sublime as a narrative experience. Okay, so whereas the schemas of rising motion and boundary underlie the developments within the plot. For example, the hero is becoming stronger or an obstacle is finally overcome. In other words, these are the elements of the text that we can retell when someone asks us a question, hey, what's the story? what is the story about? Uh, the feature of sequentiality, by contrast, should be measurable on the formal level of the narrative, that is to say, in the vocabulary. So in other words, if stories meant to provoke strong experiences, such as the sublime, are narrated by novelists as complex dynamic metaphors that map upon the schema of sequential ascent beyond the boundary, then I suggest that we should be able to discover regularities in the very language of the narrative. In other words, I believe that sequentiality will by necessity signal itself through the vocabulary of the text. And this formulation, uh, brings me into a certain disagreement with a recent book by Nigel Fab, A Theory of Thrills, Sublime and Epiphany in Literature, uh, where Fab, Fab argues that the strong experience of the sublime requires surprise uh, to take place. And I believe that surprise is not the most fortunate term here because we can listen to the same piece of music again and again, and we can know it by heart, and it will still give us goosebumps from time to time. I don't know if you have such songs, but I do know that by listening to the same song again and again, I still can get the thrills and, and, and goosebumps from time to time. So I agree uh, with Fab that uh, the event structure and as uh, understood as hierarchical and sequential is very important for our understanding of the sublime. However, I have doubts about uh, the surprise uh, as, as being like kind of the core concept 
Actually, I do believe that preparation for this boundary crossing experience, which we know is coming, is really a constitutive component of the sublime. So it's not just about the surprise, it's the whole process that leads to the boundary crossing experience, so that momentous, momentous event that needs to be taken into account as a whole. So now that was a theoretical part. And let me now get into more the age part of this project. So the question is, how is this narrative pattern constructed? How is vocabulary distributed in a text to successfully activate this schema in the reader? I believe that regardless of the culture environment, the pattern in question stays the same uh, because it draws upon cognitive architecture that is common to the human species as a whole. However, its particular articulations in narratives are culture specific. So in 20th century China, the ancient parable about the foolish old man who removed the mountains and the story of great Yu controlling the waters, uh, Yugong Yishan and Da Yu Zhishui, have been appropriated to promote the aesthetic of hero worship and collective voluntarism. So this was the allegory of the rise of the modern Chinese nation. But there is yet another text that proved equally, if not even more stimulating to modern Chinese imagination, uh, however, and that was Maxim Gorky's famous poem, Song of the Stormy Petrel. Uh, so Stormy Petrel, the bird, soon became a triumphant harbinger of revolution and an embodiment of idealist fervor in socialist camp. So what I do is I train, actually I use an already pre-trained word to back model, uh, those pre-trained on a large corpus of Chinese texts to find words similar to the words used in Gorky's poem. In other words, I'm looking for terms and expressions that are used frequently in descriptions of powerful natural phenomena. And in total, this semi-supervised procedure yields 317 words and phrases. And this is the sublime vocabulary and the building blocks onto which the schema of sequential ascent beyond the boundary is mapped uh, by the narrative. So the next step is to find words that are correlated with this vocabulary in the narrative space of a particular novel. So we, here we move a step down from a huge corpus of Chinese texts toward a specific novelistic text. And the question here is, how does the plot of the text actually parasitize our visceral reactions to powerful natural phenomena described within it? Because natural phenomena, as they are described in a text by themselves, they lack such sublime logic. It is the plot that needs to bestow meaning upon descriptions of natural world. And here I use topic modeling, uh, a text mining technique that allows us to find groups of words that occur together more frequently than if they were randomly distributed uh, in a text. And I find words that frequently co-occur with the sublime vocabulary that I have just determined. So for example, if we find words such as ocean or storm in a text, and then we find that whenever ocean appears in a text, the word renching or people, the crowds of, of, of people uh, also appear in a text, that means that these two words are correlated. And the same, for example, descriptions of battles when two armies struggle against each other. If the battle is frequently compared to a storm, then again, we know that these words are correlated and this is how the plot basically parasitizes upon descriptions of this powerful natural phenomena. Okay, so, so far I have determined two sets of vocabulary, the vocabulary of the sublime as kind of a general culture specific group of words and the novel specific vocabulary correlated with it. However, this information is still not specific enough to answer the question as to how exactly a particular novel entangles these two groups of words uh, in the diachronic series to, to produce this powerful aesthetic experience. So we need to move even further down to the level of individual passages uh, and fragments of the text, which I believe constitute the liminal spaces, uh, as Fab puts it, where the movement beyond the boundary actually takes place. And here I would like to spend a little bit more time. Uh, so as we remember, uh, Longinus argued that in the sublime, one great phrase after another is wheeled into place with increasing force. And I take great phrase literally here. So a great sentence or a great phrase is a sentence that contains at least one word from the vocabulary of the sublime that we have determined uh, just now. 
Uh, and then we claim is that the sublime words actually are parasitized upon by the topical words. In other words, the plot paras parasitizes the sublime. In other words, I draw a coherence edge between a sublime node and a topical node if the distance between them does not exceed two sentences. So as we move through the text, we generate our co-occurrence network. And one way of interpreting this process is to say that while topical nodes, the correlated vocabulary, acquire the sublimity, the sublime aura from the sublime words in their neighborhood, at the same time, the sublime nodes simultaneously acquire local, novel specific information from the topical terms that surround them. And now if the author provides enough great sentences or great phrases and then describes some momentous events using the, the topical vocabulary, so finally some sort of boundaries is crossed in the plot, two lovers find each other, mountain peak is uh, reached, uh, river is crossed, etc. I believe that that's the moment uh, roughly where the strong experience have a chance of arising. Okay, so we have descended from a macroanalysis of a larger corpus of Chinese texts to a microanalysis of individual words and terms in a particular tension resolution passage. I believe that this, these computational techniques employed along the way allow us to reverse engineer the narrative technology of the sublime, which is a mechanism that synchronizes two vocabulary distributions, the plot-related terms and the sublime imagery within a metaphor of transcendence. And this network interpretation foregrounds the role of words as conduits not only of semantic meaning, but also affective energy. So I would like to show now this mechanism in action. And due to time constraints, I think I'm only going to read one novel, Second Son, The Argat Haya by Liu Bayu, published in 1987. Um, so I generate topic models following the methods just explained, and then plot the vocabulary distribution over the diachronic axis of the narrative. So you can see that there are at least three liminal spaces or potential triggers of strong experience in the text. We have one here where both the sublime vocabulary, the kind of natural description, and the correlated vocabulary, the plot vocabulary are highly present. You also have the middle of the text, and towards the end of the novel as well. Um, so the novel itself uh, narrates the relentless struggle of the Chinese Communist Liberation Army in the Hubei province during the civil war uh, against the Guomindang forces. Uh, as the Liberation Army struggles to conquer Wuhan, the soldiers face the turbulent waters of the Yangtze River. And later on, as the war spreads further south, uh, the scorching heat the devastating floods and torrential rains all bring tremendous difficulties to the soldiers accustomed to the more you know, northern climate. So the Wuling Mountains and the Yangtze River provide a perfect scenic backdrop for this heroic bravery of the Chinese soldiers as, as it is depicted in the novel. And the South becomes an object for the of the colonial desire of the northerner. And the crossing of the Yangtze River is precisely in the very middle of the text which is the most intense episode of the whole story, both in terms of plot development here, as well as vocabulary distribution in terms of the sublime. Uh, so right in the middle of the novel, the army faces the tremendous powers of the untamed nature of China's South. As the author puts it, two mighty torrents formed between heaven and earth. One was the torrent of nature with raging waters and powerful thunders. One was the torrent of the people struggling bravely against the waves. If the former was violent, the latter was fearless. It is exactly these two mighty torrents that spurred into existence a human life's most precious character, spirit, power. So in this fragment, Chen Wenhong, the, the leader, the military leader, brings to the fore the fortitude of the soldiers under his command who march forward and cross the mighty Yangtze while being shelled by the enemy forces entrenched of the other side. This is a network visualization of this particular episode. And these are the uh, statistics with eigenvector centrality, uh, which I didn't have time to focus on uh, too much in this presentation. But this is a list of nodes that most are most strongly correlated with the node in another group. So these are the nodes belonging to the sublime group. These are the nodes belonging to the topical group. And we see that both the main characters are very strongly uh, correlated with these descriptions of powerful natural phenomena. Uh, something similar happens towards the end of the story when Qin Zhen, another main character, 
reluctantly leaves the battlefield to attend the Grand Podko events in the capital, which is the founding ceremony of the People's Republic of China, 1st of October, 1949, which is again presented here in this mesmerizing terms of grandeur. The quoted passage as seen here is the pinnacle of the revolutionary tale, a collective experience of awakening that merges the multitude of singular bodies into one nation. And on the background of this human multitude, the rising flag symbolizes the crossing of the historical boundary be between pre and post 1949 uh, China. So the nationalist discourse embraces here the sublime on the square, absorbing a number of sublime words such as to see, tremor, ocean, etc. And a lot of heavy lifting is done through such metaphorical work. So the square is likened to a raging sea, the deafening cheers of the crowds to thunderous waves, etc. So Leo Bayou's novel here conveys this enthusiasm surrounding the birth of the nation by addressing his readers' kinesthetic memories of powerful natural phenomena, such as devastating floods and heavy downpours. Um, and again, these are my statistics of that particular network. I won't have time to delve too much into Soul Mountain, a novel by Gao Xingjian, the Nobel Prize winner. Uh, suffice it to say that here erotic uh, imagery as well is accompanied by this uh, natural uh, imagery, uh, natural um, vocabulary and, and depictions of, uh, of the um, natural world, and, but also religious experiences of monks praying in a Buddhist monastery as well um, partake in this sublime imagination. So I'm reaching my conclusion. Um, I believe that computational criticism can draw our attention to the ways in which the formal arrangement of vocabulary works in synchrony with the novel's plot to actually achieve this powerful aesthetic effect or strong experience that we can now theorize as the sublime. I believe that we should also see the sublime as an embodied experience of sequential ascent beyond the boundary that is elicited through this narrative process that associates sensory motor memories of powerful phenomena with secondary discourse, whether nationalism, religion, or even sexuality. And finally, the sublime as understood here is a rhetorical concept, not an ethical one. And therefore it is free from Kantian metaphysics and as such can be very useful, uh, serve as a very useful avenue for, for uh, cross-cultural inquiry. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions.